All right, so anyway, so that journey of product development, after 10 years of existence, understanding the market, what the market drivers were, I outsourced product development, you know. And that person that did the product development also did the manufacturing. And that process really worked good for about 15 years, doing more and more each and every year, lessons learned, more products that help us grow our revenue. And I'll talk about that revenue growth, the gross margin, just shortly. But I made it a strategic decision in 2012 because the opportunities were so significant, let's bring product development in-house. And as I mentioned at the outset, of our 40 employees today, 10 are in product development, electrical engineers, mechanical engineers, computer science, so that we can do our own circuit board design, write our own code for software, for our own cloud solution, our apps, and things like that. So I set out and hired a, a excuse me, hired a VP of product development in 2012, and he hired his team. And I'll show you very shortly what those financials look like. So where do we find some of this technology? Because this is some of the sources that you can look at and looking at opportunities, you know, when you don't see them so conspicuously in the front of your eyes. Technology transfer. So our first major product development was in the early 2000 period with NASA. The Stennis Space Center, just outside of New Orleans. They governed satellite, all the satellites out of the Stennis Space Center and the rocket engines. And they had developed a device to measure how green is vegetation, how dense is vegetation. And their engineering prototype looked like a miniature shoebox. So we were one of, I don't know, 70, 80 companies that were invited to their announcement of that technology transfer opportunity. We were one of 12 companies that did a business plan on how we would finish the development and commercialize it. And of those 12 that submitted those plans, we were selected and we received that exclusive. So that is the end result of a handheld meter that measures the reflected green through a lens and tells us when plants are under stress or when they need more nitrogen. So technology transfer, here's another example. And this is an app on an Apple iPhone that takes the picture of the corn leaf and compares it to two reference dots or colors that adjust for the ambient light on a bright sunny day or a partly cloudy day. So that as it measures that greenness of the leaf and computes it mathematically, it can tell us when we need more nitrogen. And there's an example that you know, we would never thought had existed or would exist 15 years ago. How apps are so powerful and how they're a part of the conduit of telemetry, moving data from a handheld device, Bluetooth, through our phone, and up to the cloud. So technology transfer. So we're connected today with the major universities. And it not only exists, this technology transfer, for hardware and electronics, but for medical, materials, you know, engineering, where there could be alter, alternate materials that could replace plastics, wood, steel, and have lots of advantages, maybe from a cost standpoint. So technology transfer, and of course acquisition. Right now we're acquiring, this happens to be a soil moisture profiler, meaning this device is placed in the root zone below the ground. And it measures the soil moisture at four inch, eight inch, 12, all the way down to 48 inches at the depths that you want to measure, depending on where the root structure exists. So that happens to be a competitive device. The technology we're acquiring, and we're going to spend about 185,000 euros, which is about 200,000 US. What's different is that technology here has these brass rings. So those two rings are sensing at, say, four inch depth. And then the circuit board is on the inside. Circuit boards are fiberglass. They're not very flexible. Here's what's different about the technology we're acquiring and designing. So if you can envision an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper that has, it's a circuit board. 
and it has the components placed on it and soldered on it, the capacitors, the diodes, the controllers. And what's unique is that circuit board is flexible. It can be rolled up, that flexible circuit board, and it's more than half the cost of that technology. So what's that mean? It can be a lot more affordable and we can have more sensors in different soil textures in a vineyard, in an apple orchard, or in a golf course. And so that's how we look at opportunities is where does the technology change because it's forever changing. So acquisition is another part of the strategy. This is kind of an interesting slide about the adoption of technology. We all know what the adoption of PCs and laptops and now smartphones look like and tablets and iPads. But that's really a consumer type product. When you talk about technology for agriculture, the adoption is painfully slow. Has been for 40 years and will be for another 40 years. And that bodes the question, why? Why is te technology so slow to be adopted? Probably the number one reason is Mother Nature. Mother Nature delivers a different growing season of rainfall and temperatures. Too much, too little, so that in that crop yield or that crop quality and how that plays out, there's a lot of variables that affect it. It could be insect pressure, could be disease pressure, could be it ran out of nutrients. So there are a lot of variables that aren't easily measured that play out in how that crop yield is achieved. And so in terms of adoption, about two and a half percent of any market, consumer or business, are innovators. They sought us out years ago. And that really helped us grow the business in the early days and even today. Right behind the innovators are the early adopters. They love technology. They just want to make sure you're going to be around for tech support. If they have needs, because the product may not be that robust, but you'll be there to answer the questions, to fix the problems. So the innovators and early adopters are about 15%, one out of every six of any given market. When you really want to look at what the market potential is for any new segment or market you want to get into. The real sweet spot is the early majority. The early majority is about 35%. They are a little bit different. They'll follow behind maybe two or three years. They need more information. They need more education. You know, they need more help getting them out of their comfort zone. Of why should I measure something I've never ever measured before? What's it gonna do for me? And so really when I look at our market, let's say there's 16,000 golf courses in North America, maybe 30,000 worldwide. What that really says in our technology space, only half of that 16,000 will ever be a viable market, target market. So it's a, a way of really quantifying and doing a business development proposition for what any new product, software, or service market potential revenue-wise could look like. Behind them are the late majority and laggards. They're the people approaching retirement. They're the people that just aren't comfortable with technology. They don't email. They don't text. They seldom go on the internet and search for technology. So that 50% will never be part of our market. And you have to ask yourself the same kinds of questions when you look at if you could segment your market and what their pain points are, what keeps them up at night? What stresses them? And I feel to some extent we understand what the day and the life of a golf course superintendent looks like and feels like for them. Or a wine grape grower. What keeps them up at night? Is it mother nature? Is it economics? Is it regulation? Lack of labor? And the more you know about that, the more you can be objective and have the prospects of success in developing products and delivering them to the market. So let's look at some numbers. So in the 1997 to 2012 time frame, we we're investing maybe 250,000 dollars in product development annually, growing that to maybe 400,000. 
And then, as I mentioned, in 2012, I made the decision to bring it in-house. Hired that VP of product development. So that occurred late in 2012. 2013 was the full year. So here's our R&D expenditure, most of which, of course, is people. A little bit in systems. And so here's that R&D as a percent of revenue. That's an interesting metric. I can remember 40, 50 years ago when my dad was in the stock market and he would go to annual stockholders meetings for Caterpillar, Deere and Company, and you would get hammered by Wall Street if you reduced your R&D, if you're in the pharmaceuticals, because they knew that in two or three years, because of your reduction in R&D, you're going to lose your competitive position. And that's pretty darn logical. So for us, you know, we're pretty aggressive in the amount of dollars as a percent of revenue even today. So this year, we're going to, you know, we'll have revenues of about 10 million. And if we spend about a million and a half in, in R&D, that really says that 15 cents out of every dollar is going into product development. Because product development is part of this flywheel that's mentioned in the book, Good to Great. And how do you get this flywheel spinning? With people, and people in the right seat. And what's your hedgehog concept? What are you really good at that really makes money that you can develop a core competency and create a much more sustainable business? And so, benchmarking. We always talk about benchmarking. Because how do you know what's good or bad? A single number by itself is just a number. But when you compare it, then you're more objective, right? And so I've always tried to benchmark, you know, how are we doing? What should our numbers look like? And so forth. And so when you see these surveyors, these surveyors that are putting in the, you know, the stakes for the lot lines or mapping out where a foundation is going to be built when construction exists or highway. So Trimble... Trimble Navigation owns that space. They're publicly traded. So you can look at their financials online. And we can look at the agricultural sector, because they're somewhat of a fringe competitor. And I can see what their revenue growth looks like in the industry that we're in, even though we really don't compete in most of the product categories. I can look at what their R&D spend is. And their R&D spend is about 12%. So I would say, you know, once we get this thing working more efficiently, that should probably be our metric, is 12% of our revenue should be going into product development on an ongoing basis, give or take. So now you have a picture of what that R&D investment looks like. So what does it do for the company? When I get my financials, which I'll get tomorrow, every, the fifth day of every month, I expect it and I get it. Balance sheet income statement. The first line I look at, gross margin. And to see, you know, what's happening in those dynamics. And here's what that journey looks like from this period. So before we did product development, when we found products, repositioned them, had a couple exclusives, we were in the 35, 37% of gross margin. Then when we started product development, we grew it from 42 to 47 when I was outsourcing it. And this period grew it even more. And today, and for the last, you know, seven, eight, nine years, it's been hovering just below 60%. Is that good? You bet it's good. And you know, here's the interesting thing. So, you now understand we're global. And globally, we sell through distributors, and even domestically. These distributors are getting a 35, 40% discount. So they're buying a product that's discounted by 30 to 45, 40%, and we're still getting a 58% gross margin. Margins are everything. What are they, and that's why I avoid the commodity business. Because you know what? How do you be more efficient? And you're going to deal lean and mean, and so on and so forth. So it's really a decision point 
of what new products, what new services, what technology can you integrate into what you're doing today, you know, that can create a more sustainable business for you. And always be on that lookout. First knowing your customers and how they're different and unique and how you can bring those products to drive these gross margins. Here's what the EBITDA looks like. So actually last year for the first time we have quarterly meetings with all the Spectrumites. Spectrum employees, we call them Spectrumites. And so we disclose to them, you know, our expenses. And then we break it down by segment and we give them insight as to what's working well and what's not working well. You've got to be candid, you've got to be up front. Because some of, in some cases, they're contributing to what that looks like. And so during the period of 2010 to 2013, even though it averaged 17.5% EBITDA, it ranged from 16 to as high as 22%. And I mean, we were luckily cutting a fat hog. You know, not that we're doing a lot of things right. So I had a lot of cash sitting in the bank. So here we have good gross margins, a good, and, and for the last eight or nine years, we've had the good fortune we've not had to borrow any money. I've got a line of credit at the bank, we all do to some extent, never have had to draw on it because the business has been fortunately a good cash flow generator, accounts receivable are clean and so on and so forth. But now that we've made that investment in R&D, it has had an impact on our EBITDA dropping. So you can do the math, 9 minus 17 and a half percent. And you just saw in the previous slide how much we've invested in research and development. With the vision, it's got to pay off. It's got to work. So our goal, again, Trimble, is our benchmark. 12% EBITDA, 12% R&D, and on an annual basis, 12% growth. And of course, there's going to be those cycles of the economy. But that's what success could look like. And that's how we look at our business and benchmark it to others in our industry to see just how healthy and how well is it working. So let me talk about uh, another metric, and that's the payback. So if we invest, you know, 200000 in this soil moisture profiler, Ideally, it should pay back within two years. Some products pay back quicker, some are a little bit longer. But we do a business case. The financials, the three-year projection, looking at the margins, the selling price, the target market, on any of these programs that we develop. And so fortunately, we get some nice awards. These awards don't necessarily add revenue to the bottom line. And actually, there are a couple products that didn't do very, very well. Because really, it's the customer who determines how successful you are. So, lessons learned. All about people. No-brainer. And, and, you know, and it's the balance between the academic strength of that person and their street smarts. Where street smarts is experiences learned. And so we've had some issues with product reliability and not being on time and on budget that, you know, we're working through as a new team. So we got things to improve on. So what would I do different? You know, and actually my successor just made the change this week to replace the VP of product development because it wasn't working right. He wasn't the right leader holding people accountable and so forth. So that's our story. Hopefully you've had one or two takeaways, but any questions if we have time, Kevin? I'm for a couple of questions. Um, any questions for Mike? Yeah. Your analysis was uh, any uh, market, any, any analysis of your competitors. Do you have competitors that are doing you know. Right. Right. So it's, it's a really a good question. We do have competitors. We're seeing more and more competitors. I call them fringe competitors. That really wasn't the scope of, you know, of, of, of this. But, you know, but I mean, you know, 
When I see competitors doing things that we're not doing, I'm not very happy. So we do have some fringe competitors and we're going to have more and more. The question is who will be sustainable? Yes. Yes, Roger. Um, I believe you said that you had been at around 10 million for a while. Okay. Is that a correct statement? So yes. Okay. So can you sustain profitability and um, market share, et cetera, at that level? Or do you have to have a plan to grow a certain amount to keep that same level of profitability? Did everybody hear his question? You know, about this $10 million level? So, actually, you know, in full disclosure, so last year our revenues dropped about 9%. You know, some of that's us, some of it's the industry. Deer and Company, who does a lot of things right, their agricultural sales dropped 26%. So I don't know if that, that makes us feel any better because we don't compete in their space. But anyway, um, and we introduced a product that took our sales force off focus. Salespeople love new products. And here we've been in our second year with some reliability issues that mentally impacted our salespeople. But here I think is the most important answer to a great question. That $10 million revenue level and, and breaking through it is a challenge in systems, right? And people. And so that's where we are today. And that's above my skill set. And that's why I have a successor to take this company to the next level.